And welcome back, Professor Almeida, jpalmeida.com, with another lecture in my series on critical thinking. It's Friday, I'm here at the office, streetwear and all, to give you a lecture on how to formally evaluate arguments. Now, before I go further, I do have two housekeeping items. Number one, I do these lectures live. There really isn't a script. And you can imagine how painful it would be to have to parse through everything I'm saying in this video. Fortunately, Google has a bot that does that. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can turn on closed captioning. It's not perfect, but hey, it's better than nothing. Also, with this being live, there's a very good possibility that I might lose my train of thought. It might derail on me. I might misspeak. I might say things like so. So with that said, see, I caught that. Let's move on to the next item, and that concerns practicing, especially when it comes to critical thinking and the skills you are going to learn in this presentation. It is very important that you don't just sit back passively and let Professor Almeida explain everything while you just nod your head, right? You do need to practice in order to better deconstruct arguments, to better restate them. As a matter of fact, you have a discussion activity where you do restate arguments. And you want to make sure that you understand that so you can construct truth tables and Venn diagrams as you will see in this presentation. One last thing too, these videos do tend to be long. And if you don't want to hear me babble, again, you can put me on mute, you can read the transcript, you can skip to the part of the video that you need to see, or you can rewind if something isn't clear. That's the beauty of this being online, right? All right, with that said, let's get right into it. Let's talk about formally evaluating arguments. This coincides with chapter two of the OER textbook, Introduction to Logical and Critical Thinking. Now, if you have at least skimmed through that chapter, there's a very good possibility that you might be lost in a sea of key terms and symbols. It's a tough read, but I'm here to demystify it for you. So by the end of this presentation, you should be able to describe the goals of formally evaluating arguments to be able to understand propositional logic using truth tables to identify negation, disjunction, and conditionals, and finally to understand categorical logic using Venn diagrams. And I want to begin by revisiting the informal test of validity. This is something we have been doing all along. And I want to ask you if you can imagine a scenario where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Now, recall what we talked about validity. For an argument to be valid, the conclusion has to logically follow from its premises, right? You have two statements. Your conclusion has to logically follow. Take, for instance, this. All humans are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. It's a valid argument because the conclusion logically follows. Now, if both premises are true, where Socrates is a man, all humans are mortal, we can back those up, we have evidence. So if those premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. We can't have a valid argument where the premises are true and yet the conclusion is false. So make sure that you understand that. Now, I wanna ask you the next question. Does everyone have the same imagination? Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, if you've ever seen that cartoon, right? If you've ever seen that cartoon strip Dilbert, Scott Adams likes to talk about the two dimensions as watching two different movies on the same screen. I've mentioned the two dimensions before in past lectures. And in each dimension, you have a group, they have their own beliefs, they've made up their own minds, and likewise with the other dimension. Well, they are watching two different movies on the same screen. What is Scott Adams trying to say? Scott Adams is more or less saying that people have different imaginations, they have different understandings, and you can see where the informal test of validity has its limits. So if we want to determine if an argument is valid or not, we need more formal methods that are as precise and objective as possible. Let's start with this example. It is cold and wet today. And if we break this down, we really see that there are two statements here. It is cold today. It is wet today. We can also write a conclusion. Therefore, it is cold today. Is this a valid argument? Of course it is. 
This is also what's called a conjunction because you see the word and here. And this is where propositional logic comes in. It deals with the logical relationships between propositions or statements. Remember what we said about statements? Statements are sentences or utterances which can be true or false. Consider this example. The dishes have been washed and the trash has been taken out. So let's say you've had to do some household chores and you did those two things. Well, if you indeed, if you indeed complete both of those tasks, let's say you did wash those dishes and you took out the trash, then the entire conjunction is true. Now, if you did one or the other, that would make the entire conjunction false. And obviously, if you just got lazy, well, the conjunction is going to be false anyway. Now, we need to find a way to better represent all of those possible scenarios and whether the conjunction would then be true or false. And we do so through truth tables. And as you can see here, I have constructed a truth table. It is very important that you understand how truth tables work. And I want to extend this also to Venn diagrams, as you will see later on in this presentation, because if you are in COSA 2, you will learn how to use Microsoft Word to create tables and smart art graphics. And Microsoft Word is a great way to construct truth tables and Venn diagrams. So this is where the tech comes in with this class. As you can see here, I have broken up the conjunction into two statements, washing the dishes and taking out the trash. So when you create your truth table, you're gonna have your categories, so your two statements and the conjunction, you're going to list out all the possible scenarios and then you're going to evaluate them. So let's say that you wash the dishes, that's true, and you took out the trash. That would mean that this conjunction here is true. Now, if you've done one or the other, let's say you washed the dishes, but you didn't take out the trash, or you took out the trash and you didn't wash the dishes, that would make the entire conjunction false. And lastly, if you just got lazy, well, then the whole conjunction is false. You need to watch for some indicator words. We've talked about this in the past. You've seen the word and, but you also want to look out for other words such as these. Again, this is going to take some practice. Let's continue on with conjunctions and try to identify the independent statements in conjunctions. Consider this example. Bob and Jane are married. Okay, Bob and Jane are married. And right away you can see the issue here. If we were to break this up into the two statements, Bob is married, Jane is married. Can this be correct? Because if we look at the original conjunction, it's implying that Bob and Jane are married to each other. But in looking at the statement, Bob is married. Well, is Bob married to Jane or is Bob married to someone else? So it's not entirely clear here. On the other hand, let's look at this example. Maya and Alice are women. If we break this conjunction up into the two statements, Maya is a woman and Alice is a woman, then we can readily identify those two independent statements. So this is something you need to watch out for with conjunctions. Let's now look at negation. Negation switches the truth value of a proposition from false to true or true to false. Consider this example. Las Vegas is not the capital of Nevada. Now, if the statement were to read Las Vegas is the capital of Nevada, we would then determine the proposition or statement to be false because we know that Carson City is the capital of Nevada. But as soon as we add not there, that changes the proposition from false to true. And then you can see what would happen vice versa. Let's look at what a disjunction is. With disjunctions, usually include the word or. Consider, for example, the PSA, click it or ticket. What are they really saying? What they're saying is this, either buckle your seatbelt or get a ticket. Again, we're gonna construct a truth table and let's break this down. Consider this scenario where your seatbelt is buckled and you do not get a ticket. Well, we can then say that this disjunction is true. Your seatbelt's not buckled, you get pulled over, you get a ticket. Okay, we can also say that this is true. 
Now let's consider this. Your seatbelt is buckled, but you still get pulled over and you get a ticket. Now this disjunction is true because in this scenario, perhaps you got a ticket for speeding, you got pulled over for running a stop sign, or let's say your brake light was out and you got pulled over and you were given a ticket. Well, in this case, your disjunction is still true. And the final possibility, your seatbelt is not buckled and you do not get a ticket. Well, unless you are really, really lucky, in this case, the disjunction is going to be false. So again, this is something that requires a lot of practice and you wanna make sure that you have a really good grasp on how to construct these truth tables. Let's consider this example. Jane will not have both pie and ice cream. Jane will have neither pie nor ice cream. Okay, we have these two statements here. Let's construct a truth table and look at the different possibilities. Let's say that Jane has pie and Jane has ice cream. Well, right away, it is false because we said that Jane will not have both pie and ice cream. Jane will have neither pie nor ice cream. Let's look at this possibility. Let's say that Jane has pie but doesn't have ice cream. Okay, well now we can say it's true. Likewise, let's say that Jane has ice cream but not pie. Again, this is true. Let's look at the last possibility. Jane does not have pie. Jane does not have ice cream. Okay, we said here, Jane will not have both pie and ice cream. That is true. Jane will have neither pie nor ice cream. And that is true. Let's take this one step further and let's consider the truth table test of validity. The convict escaped either by crawling through the sewage pipes or by hiding out in the back of the delivery truck, but the convict did not escape by crawling through the sewage pipes. Therefore, the convict escaped by hiding out in the back of the delivery truck. Let's restate this by rewriting these statements into standard form. So we have premise one, premise two, and the conclusion. And when we restate this, we see that premise one is a disjunction and premise two is a negation. Now, in the reading, the author uses the term atomic propositions. Okay, so make sure you kind of have an understanding of what the author is saying. But for the sake of this discussion, I just want to call these variables, right? We have two variables here, the delivery truck and the sewage pipes. So when we construct our truth table, it's going to look like this, okay? We have our two reference columns with the atomic propositions, or again, I'm gonna say variables here, delivery truck and sewage pipes, right? Here is premise one, premise two, and the conclusion. So we need to consider all of the possible scenarios and then evaluate the validity of the two premises and the conclusion. And as you can see here, for the delivery truck, the conclusion more or less matches up with the delivery truck. So if the convict did use the delivery truck, then the conclusion is going to be true. With the sewage pipes, we have to consider the scenario where the convict either used the sewage pipes or did not use the sewage pipes. So let's look at the premises here. The convict used the sewage pipe or the delivery truck. Well, if both are true, then that would make this true. If one of these are true, then this premise would still be true. Now, let's say that the convict did not use the sewage pipe. Well, it's going to be the opposite of the scenario for the sewage pipe. So if we say that the convict used the sewage pipe, then this premise is false. On the other hand, if the convict did not use the sewage pipe, then the premise would be true. Okay, so again, this takes practice. What's the takeaway from this? Make sure that your reference columns cover every logically possible scenario. An argument is valid if and only if the premises are true, then the conclusion is true. Remember that the conclusion cannot be false if the premises are true. Now, if there is a row where the premises are true, but the conclusion is false, then the argument is invalid. So when we look at this, we can say that we have a valid argument here. Consider the conditionals. Conditionals usually revolve around if then. It's like programming where you have if then statements. If given a condition and if it's true, then this happens. Let's consider this example. If it is raining, then the ground is wet. Again, we construct a truth table where we look at rain, the ground, and then our statement. Well, I'm asserting here that if it is raining, then the ground is going to be wet. So if it's raining and the ground is wet, then the statement is true. 
But if it's raining and the ground is not wet, then it's false because I'm asserting that if it's raining, then the ground is indeed going to be wet. And if the ground's not wet, then that makes this statement false. But consider on the other hand, let's say that the ground is wet because maybe there's a sprinkler running. But I'm asserting again that if it's raining, then the ground's going to be wet, which still makes this true, right? Because I'm asserting again, if it's going to rain, then the ground is wet. But the ground's wet, even if it's not raining, this is still true. Let's say it doesn't rain and the ground's not wet. But again, I'm asserting if it's raining, then the ground is wet, which makes this true. I hope this makes some sense. Again, make sure that you practice this. Again, you want to watch for indicators. I have a list right here. Let's consider this argument. All humans are mortal. All mortal things die. Therefore, all humans die. Is this a valid argument? Well, again, we see from the conclusion, it logically follows our two premises. So if we look at the informal test of validity, we can say that this is a valid argument. But let's construct a truth table and consider all the possibilities. And if you notice here in the second row, which is shaded red, we see that we have a false conclusion. Now, by using the truth table then, we could say that this argument is invalid, but we can back up these statements here. All humans are mortal. We can certainly back this up with evidence. All mortal things die. Again, we can certainly back this up with evidence. So if these two premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So what does this mean then? It means that there are limits to using truth tables and some things cannot be shown using propositional logic. And this is where categorical logic comes into play. It deals with the logical relationships between categorical statements. So let's look at this again. We have a statement about categories of humans and things that are mortal. We have a statement about categories of things that are mortal and things that die. And finally, we have a conclusion, which is a statement about humans and things that die. We can graphically represent these relationships using Venn diagrams. Now, I've drawn up a Venn diagram here where the dark blue represents nothing in category. Okay, so looking at this, we see that humans are in one circle, we see mortal in another circle, and the intersection between them is saying that humans are mortal. I hope this makes sense, and again, this is something that you really need to practice with. And let me quickly find the page here that deals with Venn diagrams. Again, with chapter two, the reading can be a bit challenging, and so my hope here is that you can make sense of this. So on page 116, okay, on page 116, this is where uh, the author talks about Venn diagrams. And so again, let's look at what the author says. There are two circles representing the two categories, humans and things that are mortal. And you have this overlap right here that refers to both human and mortal. So the this Venn, allows that there are things in the category that things are mortal because it's not just humans it could be mammals dogs cats reptiles they're mortal things right so this allows for things that are not necessarily human but are mortal on the other hand we have nothing in this category here okay i hope that this makes some sense how about this statement some birds don't fly again we construct a venn diagram where we have things that fly that aren't necessarily birds, okay? Think about insects. But we're saying here that some birds don't fly, okay? Again, what does the middle represent? This represents birds that fly. But we also have birds that don't fly, right? And that's what this asterisk means right here, okay? So make sure that you have an understanding of that in the reading. Now, we have different categorical forms. All subjects are predicate. And I'm using the abbreviations here. No S are P, some S are P, and some S are not P. How would you represent these with Venn diagrams? Take a look at page 123 in your reading for the answer. Okay, so again, take a look at page 123. You'll see the Venn diagrams for these. Now, let's apply 
the Venn diagram to a validity test. Consider this statement. All cars are vehicles, therefore all vehicles are cars. And again, I meant to say argument here. So let's draw up the two Venn diagrams for the premise and conclusion respectively. On the left side, we have all cars are vehicles. So again, this dark blue represents nothing here. So what we are saying is that we have cars that are vehicles, but this also opens up the possibility of vehicles that aren't cars. And on the right side, we have the conclusion saying that all vehicles are cars. Again, the dark blue being nothing in this category. But this also leaves open the possibility that there are cars which aren't vehicles. But we are saying that all vehicles are cars. Is this a valid argument? Okay, again. Think about, the, think about what we are saying here, that there's a possibility that we have cars that aren't vehicles. We are actually introducing uh, something new here, and that's where the issue is. This is not a valid argument because there's information that's not already contained in the premise, okay? Because remember the premise, the premise here is that All cars are vehicles, right? All cars are vehicles. Okay, we have the possibility that there are some vehicles which aren't cars, but the conclusion is saying that all vehicles are cars. Well, if we look at this premise right here, we just said that there are some vehicles that aren't necessarily cars. So this is new information, and so this makes the argument not valid. Okay, I hope this makes some sense. Again, this is something you need to practice on. Going back to this, okay, here's our Venn diagram, okay? So we draw up a Venn diagram like this, and let's take one at a time here. Let's look at the first premise. We shade out humans which aren't in things that are mortal. The second premise, we're going to shade out things that are mortal which aren't things that die. And again, you can look at the reading for this. Finally, we're going to construct a two-category VIN for the conclusion and ask ourselves if this is valid. So we have a VIN here where we have humans, we have things that die, and in the intersection we have humans that die. Okay, Things that die could also open up the possibility that mammals, you know, cats, dogs, reptiles, those are things that die too, right? Not, not just humans. Now, is this a valid argument? I'm going to leave that to you to figure out. And as always, this takes practice, okay? This isn't something that you can just sit back and watch and nod your head to. You really have to practice these concepts. So try the other examples in the reading and apply these tests to real world arguments. Go on social media, look at some arguments there, read some op-eds, and construct some truth tables and Venn diagrams and try it out for yourself. Anyway, I hope this video helps. If you have found some value in this, feel free to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.